talk about um, Anna Sikoria, um, and I'll give a Tyra's presentation as well, because she's not here right now. Uh, so when we think about anisocoria and pathology, we think about anisocoria first, um, whether the anisocoria is greater in bright light or anisocoria greater in dim light. Um, so, and I'll go over all of these, but in bright light, uh, the uh, pathologic pupil is usually is the dilated one, uh, and uh, some of our differential includes an ADs, a third nerve a palsy, pharmacologic medriasis and direct damage to the iris sphincter. And in these situations, um, in dim light, the anisocoria decreases, so they look more equal. And anisocoria that increases in uh, dim light, uh, some of the uh, differential includes Horner syndrome and pharmacologic meiosis. At least in this review, they also say physiologic anisocoria. Uh, this, is, this is a very important chart from the BCSC. Um, which I'll go over uh, little by little. Um, but again, for anisocoria that is the same in dim and bright light, it's usually physiologic uh, anisocoria. I'll talk first about this pathway, anisocoria greater in bright light, before I talk about uh, the last part. So a couple of points uh, for physiologic anisocoria. Uh, the difference uh, in the pupillary size is usually anywhere from 0.4 to 1 millimeter. Uh, greater than one millimeter, we have to think about probably not physiological anisocoria. In, in this first pathway that we see anisocoria greater than bright light, we first uh, ask whether there is iris damage. Um, and uh, if there's an iris damage, uh, we can probably see it anatomically. Uh, so the first question is, is iris anatomy normal? Uh, if it's not, then you know there's iris damage. One thing that we can get tested on as well um, um, is that <clears throat> it does not respond to pilocarpine and mimics pharmacologic medriasis as well, um, but that's why we always uh, look first. Uh, the other couple of things, other signs of it, sphincter damage by notches in the pupillary margin or transillumination defects uh, near the uh, sphincter muscle. Next is uh, pharmacologic medriasis. Uh, there's no response to light and uh, near uh, stimulation. 1% uh, or 2% will not constrict uh, uh, pupils that are pharmacologically uh, dilated. Uh, for example, uh, we can have even segmental iris palsy. There's a good movie and novel about this. Um, and uh, it, it is not super sensitive to either the 0.1 pilocarpine or the 1% or even the 2%, and that's how we would diagnose pharmacologic medriasis. Some of the sympathomimetics include cocaine, epinephrine, and phenylephrine. Some of the parasympatholytics are the atropine, tropicamide, and scopolamine. And we have to think about adrenergic medriasis as well. Uh, but in here, what we can get tested on is that accommodation is not impaired in these. The next in line is uh, AD's tonic, excuse me? For what? Um, for adrenergic medriasis. Yeah, just with adrenergic medriasis. For AD tonic pupils, sorry, let's go up. <clears throat> so, for adystonic pupil, the, uh, we really don't understand uh, what's the pathophysiology, but people think about the damage of the ciliary ganglion. Uh, and we've, studies have shown that uh, there's reduced ganglion cells. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the natural history of adystonic pupil. In the acute phase, uh, it is uh, both uh, pupils are uh, poorly reactive to light and accommodation. Uh, for the next few months, there's still light dissociation, but constriction, uh, um, could be a little better, but there's still re the redilation phase is still slow. This can be caused by several things, including surgery, trauma, infection, inflammation, or ischemia. It's associated with several systemic diseases, including diabetes, chronic alcoholism, neurosyphilis, amyloidosis, sarcoid, Miller Fisher, and Charcot Marie Tooth. Um, after we rule out all of these things, the idiopathic tonic pupil is AD's pupil. 
the epidemiology is usually 70% of people are, are women and uh, in their mid-age, uh, 20 to 50 years old. It's usually unilateral in 80%, um, but there could be bilateral cases. Uh, the Holmes AD syndrome uh, is basically an AD tonic with uh, diminished deep tendon reflexes as well as orthostatic hypotension. Um, and then finally, you know, to diagnose this, 80% uh, have uh, cholinergic denervation supersensitivity to uh, uh, low pilocarpine. And so the bigger pupil, um, which is the AD's pupil, will become the smaller uh, pupil, but we have to wait 45 to 60 minutes. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the third nerve palsy. Third nerve palsy, as uh, most of you uh, probably already know, is al almost always accompanied by ptosis and limited ocular motility. We have to think about an aneurysm at the junction of the internal carotid and posterior communicating arteries. So I think uh, those are the highlights. Um, uh, the next part is anisocoria greater in dim light. Uh, so for mechanical anisocoria as well, again, we can have previous trauma or inflammation that would lead to a posterior synechia preventing dilation. Uh, we can have pharmacologic meiosis. Um, one of the things is uh, uh, one of the meiotic agents is pilocarpine. So we always have to think about that. The next is uh, Horner syndrome. So the symptoms of Horner syndrome include ipsilateral meiosis facial anhydrosis, and ptosis. Uh, the ptosis uh, um, is because there's denerv denervation of both tarsal muscles, which uh, result in a basically narrow palpebral fissure. Anhydrosis, we really don't uh, test clinically, but uh, uh, physiologically, we get anhydrosis of the ipsilateral face uh, from first or second order lesions. Uh, in third order lesions, it usually spares the lower face and has anhydrosis in the ipsilateral forehead. And then finally, the meiosis part, it's uh, slow to redilate when lights are turned off. <clears throat> uh, this is just a picture. So for Horner syndrome, just always remember that the lesion is always ipsilateral. So the first order region, uh, 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 neuron is thought to be uh, coming from somewhere in the hypothalamus. It goes down anywhere from C7 to T2 here in the ciliospinal center of Budge-Waller. Um, the second order nu um, neuron goes up, kind of comes around, um, and then uh, synapses in the superior cervical uh, ganglion, and the third order neuron uh, goes up. Testing for Horner syndrome is very important uh, to know. Uh, the, the first test is a cocaine. Uh, this blocks reuptake of noref norepinephrine release at the synaptic nerve uh, terminals. Uh, it would cause uh, usually pupillary dilation, eyelid retraction, and conjunctival blanching of the uh, unaffected eye. But in the affected eye, there is no effect. Um, and so post-cocaine anisocoria of greater than one millimeter is still diagnostic of a Horner's. Just remember for cocaine, after you give it, there's no change in anisocoria. Uh, the other test, test for Horner's is apraconidine. Uh, this is an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist, which dilates the pupil uh, sympathetically, especially in denervated eyes, like a Horner syndrome. Um, in the unaffected eye, uh, it has no effect. Um, but in the affected eye, there's dilation. So compared to cocaine, just remember that the anisocoria reverses in, uh, with apraconidine testing. Uh, the last uh, test for foreigners that uh, we usually don't do in clinic is hydroxyamphetamine. And this basically tries to localize where the lesion is, either the first, second uh, neurons or presynaptic neurons or the third order neurons. Um, so again, this enhances the release of the presynaptic norepinephrine from an intact third order. So in the unaffected eye, uh, it causes the eye to dilate because it has normal third order neuron. In the affected eye, if, uh, if uh, the first or second order neuron are affected, um, uh, it'll cause it to dilate. But if it's a third order neuron problem, uh, there is no change. Uh, some of the... Some of the uh, causes of Horner syndrome uh, anatomically, first order could be vascular problems, tumors, demyelination. 
uh, can also show other um, brain uh, symptoms, including ataxia, nystagmus, and hemisensory defect. For second-order neurons we, uh, problems, we can have pancose tumors, uh, mediastinal lesions, thyroid mass, thoracic an aortic aneurysms, and brachial plexus trauma. Um, you can have associated symptoms of arm pain, you know, for shoulder stuff, cough, hemoptysis, swelling of neck. And then finally, for third uh, order neurons, it's a carotid artery dissection. This is what we need to think about, cluster headache, cavernous sinus lesions, uh, and associated symptoms include numbness in cranial nerve 5 and double vision. And just two things to add. Mm -hmm. um, with the apoclonidine, the other thing to look for is the ptosis resolution as well, so not just the anisocoria um, uh, being affected by that, so that's a helpful finding. And then um, the, the important point to make, just in your last slide that you had mentioned, is the localization of Horner syndrome plus S6 palsy. That is your like classic, classic cavernous sinus, so you need to kind of put it away in your mind when you see a 6 and a Horner's, you have to look there. And uh, last thing that Tara wanted to mention is the Horner's imaging. Uh, so for central processes, an MRI of the brain, and upper cervical cord. Uh, for the preganglionic, uh, we have to look at CT chest and MRI of the neck. And for postganglionic, again, MRI of the brain, MRI of the head. Um, and then just the last thing is uh, think of uh, an internal carotid artery dissection with uh, painful Horner syndrome. That's it.